Christian that doesn't know about the Holy Spirit and his gifts, it says they sit in the seat of the unlearned. And I tell pastors, I said, we just do what we do in the South, learn them, okay? I mean, that's all you gotta do is learn them. Didn't say they sit in the seat of anger or bitterness or just you know, a chip on their shoulder waiting for you to knock it off so they can leave the church. They just, ha something happens, they go, what's that? They'll look at each other and say, what was that? Well, what they need is a you know, one, one or two minute explanation after it's over of what just happened so they'll understand it. I was at a church, I think it was just outside of Pittsburgh one time. This wasn't that long ago and there was an utterance in tongues and, a, and the interpretation of it right afterwards. And there was a big, con he had like three Sunday morning services. And this, I mean, while that word was going on, the pastor was in the pulpit in a split second. I mean, when that word was over, he was standing there. And above his head was a screen. And three scriptures appeared on that screen. He said, for those of you that are here for something new and you wonder what that just was, he said, God doesn't just use me in the pulpit or the praise and worship leader. He uses you too. And there's a time that he uses you. And this is the scripture for it. Why don't you go home and look these scriptures up and you'll understand it. And I thought, in one minute, he explained something that, that churches just don't want to talk about. And I thought, how simple that is. Because they, again, they sit in the seat of the unlearned. And there's probably a day you came to a charismatic or a spirit-filled service, you thought, what in the world is going on? But after they explained it, you understood it, you begin to realize there's a whole life out there I've never even experienced in the Lord. I've just come through the front door and thought this was all of it. And the main complaint in most churches today is, even coming back today, like the charismatic movement was before it started, Baptist, Methodist, and now churches across the United States, the people are asking the same question. There's got to be more to it than this than just being saved and coming to church and hearing an inspiring sermon. There's got to be more than this because we live in a supernatural demonic world and we need to find out greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So again, it's good to be here with you this morning. And uh, I do have a couple things on the table. I've got a book called Life and Power and uh, part of what I'll be teaching on this morning is in this book. And it's called Life and Power, the Two Major Ministries of the Holy Spirit. And from those two come all the rest of the, of, of the other ministries of the Holy Spirit. Like uh, life and power, when you're born again, yes, you have life. But then there's power after that of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And from that comes guidance like you cannot believe. Important things that happen in your life and understanding and revelation of the Word. And from this one comes your life and comes from the very fact that when you're born again, you bear witness that you're a child of God. So again, the ministries of the Holy Spirit come from that. And then again, I have a book on, uh, on uh, 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 what if the best is yet to come. The reason why I called it that, and also there's a picture on the front of the, of the sun just over the horizon. And uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what to put on the front. And I was in my, one of my associate's office one day. And this was about probably two, three years before I stepped down. I was writing this book on uh, what to do during the time you step down. And uh, he had a picture on his desk and it, was, and it was a beautiful sunrise or sunset. Anyway, so I looked at it and I said, is this a sunrise or a sunset? That's the most beautiful picture. He said, I don't know. I said, you're the photographer, you ought to know. He said, he said no, you never know if it's a sunrise or sunset after you take the picture because it looks the same. He said, it's whatever you want to make it to be. And I thought, that's interesting. So I put a, a sunrise on here and you can treat it as a sunset like the best of your life is disappearing over the horizon or you can treat it as a sunrise. The best time of your life is about to come. And so that's why I put that picture on there and basically it just says, what if the best is yet to come? Because most guys I talked about talk about, I don't know if I want to sit and fish for the rest of my life. Well, don't then. Get out there and keep preaching the word. Now you can set your own schedule. I think that's wonderful. I'm not required to be someplace unless I say I want to be there. And uh, again, I love coming to churches like this because listen, I mean, I drive in, they pay for my gas, they get me a hotel, I got a big fruit basket sitting in there. I come and preach at the church and say goodbye and all the problems are left in Larry's hands, not in my hands. I enjoy this. This is a wonderful time. Oops, Larry's here. I'm sorry I shouldn't have said that. He has just shown up. But anyway, that's what I enjoy about it. And I've basically become just a pastor to pastors, a teacher to teachers. And I enjoy doing that and uh, giving them the Word of God. So this morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 11. We will eventually get there. And we're going to talk about this morning about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I bring this up is because, again, there is so much controversy about this today. Churches don't want to approach it. And here's the strange thing. Many of the churches I go to, they graduated from Rama, They graduated from ORU. These are guys that came through the charismatic movement. 
And I questioned them because they'll talk about the spirit-filled life to their church and all that. And I said, do you have, in your church, do you have an invitation for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit? They say, no, 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 it's just way too controversial. Then I ask them, every pastor I ask this, do you pray in tongues? He says, yes. I said, does it help your life? Oh, immensely. Then why are you robbing your congregation of that? Why are you so special? Why can you have it and they can't have it? If the Holy Spirit guides you, and I ask him, has there been specific times in your life the Holy Spirit has spoken to you? And he said, yes, and shown you things, yes. And I said, that doesn't come from just being born again. That comes from, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Paul had great revelations come to him. One time he was going on his second missionary journey. He went to Galatia which he went to last time, and he went there completely open to the Holy Spirit, and he made the choice to go there. I'm going to go back and establish the churches and set some leadership in the churches. He went there, and then as he started to leave, he thought, now I think I'm going to go north to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit said, no. So he said, okay, I'm going to go south into Asia, and this time the Holy Spirit forbid him to go. Notice, it's okay to make your own decisions. He made the decision to go to Galatia, and there was no resistance you got a brain. God gave you a brain. He gave you some common sense and some spiritual common sense. If you know the Word of God, you don't have to wake up each day saying, which foot should I put on the floor first? I mean, that's your choice, you know? And do I turn right at this corner or left at this corner? Because God's not into intricately leading you in every area. You're not a child. You understand that? It's so nice when your kids grow up, you can trust their decisions more and more, but you still stop them when they're doing something wrong. And so he couldn't go north, he couldn't go south, he wasn't about to go back to the east where he came from, and he had no other direction, so he just kept going west. The only thing he had peace in was go west. And he kept going, probably every day he kept saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Can't go north, can't go south, I'm not going back to the east where I came from, I'm just heading out west. And pretty soon he came to Troas, which is the ancient city of Troy. He was there on the Aegean Sea. He probably walked right out to the sea and started to step on it and said, Lord, unless I can walk on water, you better talk to me. And so he stayed there that night, and during the night, the Lord gave him a vision. Go to Macedonia. And he went to Macedonia, and all hell broke loose. He went to Philippi and all that. I can tell you, when you're in God's will, sometimes all hell breaks loose. But the point of it is, you know you're in God's will. That's how you know you're going to come out of this thing. You knew that God spoke to you. And so he did. And he went there, and he had some results in Philippi, and some results in Macedonia, some results in Thessalonica, some results here and there. And finally, he ended up in Corinth and ran out of money had to build tents and all this, but he's still in God's will. He knew this was what God told him to do. While in Corinth, he visited Ephesus, and that's when all heaven broke loose. The greatest revival of the New Testament was Ephesus. It was spoken about at the end of chapter 18, all of chapter 19 of Acts, all of chapter 20 deals with the results of the revival. All these wonderful things happened, and from the church at Ephesus, six other churches started, which are all the seven churches found in Revelation chapter 1. One church, and that was the largest church. Timothy pastored it, John pastored it, Peter visited there, Apollos was there, all these wonderful things that happened there, all because he heard the voice one time and a, and a vision come over to Macedonia. God knows what's going to happen way down here down the road and prepares you way back here. Well, where did all that come from? How could he hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that says no to Asia or Bithynia and absolutely not to go south into Asia? How do you get that? I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. All hell breaks loose in your life sometimes, but it's good to have the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues because it brings revelation like nothing else. And to rob your people of that, to me, it's just, I can't imagine that. And they describe, and they talk about from the pulpit, the Spirit-filled life, the Spirit-filled life. I said, you talk about the Spirit-filled life. Do you ever define it? Well, no, because it includes tongues. See, they're afraid of that word tongues, which they ought to be openly telling people about it and getting people filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, again, the key word in the New Testament for uh, faith and the word, and, and using your faith is the word receive. When you see the word receive, it indicates you use your faith for it. It's a gift of God. And so for salvation, we're told in John chapter 1, as many as received him. So we know salvation is received by faith. That's found throughout the Word of God. Abraham was justified by faith. David was justified by faith. Others in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. And that's, again, a word. The word received is an action word for faith. Faith receives something. We talked about last night. Faith just reaches out and takes what God is giving you in grace. Next of all, healing. The blind receive their sight. 
So healing is also received by faith. We often wait for God to drop a big thing on us, and the gifts of the Spirit do operate that way, but not just general healing. General healing is received just like salvation. You hear the Word of God, you have faith for it, and you reach out and receive it. And that's what the simplicity of divine healing is. And then the filling of the Holy Spirit. Two or three times in the New Testament, had you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. Boy, does that define the churches of the United States. Ask the congregation members, say, we haven't even heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. He's mentioned once in a while, but we don't know anything about him. He's the silent, unneeded member of the Godhead. That's basically what people think. We need God the Father, Jesus Christ, but we don't know what this Holy Spirit does. And anyway, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And the point of it is, is churches today are mingling the Holy Spirit being received and the gift that the Holy Spirit's get. The gifts the Holy Spirit gives. When it comes to the gift of tongues to be interpreted, that is given as the Spirit wills. But receiving the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Past that point, the Holy Spirit knows our personality, knows our call, and based on our call, certain gifts work with it. And so that's why not everybody speaks with tongues to be interpreted. Not everybody interprets. Not everybody is, a, not everybody, uh, is called to word of wisdom, word of knowledge, to some, to some, to some. But I can tell you when it comes to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's for all. Every believer is qualified to just ask for it and receive it. And from there, the Holy Spirit can give you the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be interpreted. Uh, uh, in tongues, in that case, to be interpreted. So I want you to look with me here at a verse of Scripture, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And we're going to talk about, again, the simplicity of faith to receive the Holy Spirit. And this is not something complicated. It's something very simple. We often make complicated things out of it. I was raised in Pentecost and receiving the Holy Spirit was very complicated. Receiving Jesus as your Savior took a quick prayer. At five years old, at vacation Bible school, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. The pastor's wife led me to the Lord, kneeled there with me at the altar, and we received Jesus, and I was born again. But when it came to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which was a couple of years later at a revival meeting, my dad said, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I was seven. And I said, yes. So he said, well, come down the front. And I found out it took a lot of work to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Usually came down to the altar about 7 or 8 o'clock, but the Holy Spirit didn't arrive until midnight. <laughs> and I often thought, why don't we start at 11.55? It would be a whole lot easier if we know what time He shows up. Why do we have to agonize all the way back here? But they said, no, no, you've got to tarry. You've got to tarry for the Holy Spirit. And so people are, and then have to, have to have a group around you, praying over you, crying over you. You know, Lord, fill him with the Spirit. And all the things they would pray for, turn loose, let go. I mean, all the things, you know, that they would tell you to do. Hang on tight. And finally, about midnight, after all that agonizing, you got so tired and gave up, you got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've been so glad to find out after that, did they ever have to tarry for the Holy Spirit? Yes, in Acts chapter 2. But after he was given, you don't have to wait for him anymore. We're waiting for something that's already showed up. And they begged the, God, fill him with the Holy Spirit. Well, he's not going to do it because he's already sent the Holy Spirit. You don't need to pray for God to send it. They prayed for them that they might receive. The whole difference, I'm trying for the person to receive because it's so simple you can receive. I remember when I went to Kenneth Hagin's meeting, camp meeting, I couldn't believe it. They invited a whole lot of people down in front that said they wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Brother Hagin said, the moment I touch you, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. Get ready. He went like this just down the line and they all started speaking with tongues. I thought, that sure blew my Pentecostal theology. <laughs> it went right out the window. All these people didn't have to tarry. We just went right on. And it's a simple act of faith to receive the Holy Spirit. Why am I teaching you this? Because you're going to face people that are going to good churches. I'm not saying these are bad churches. All the churches being formed today, these gigantic churches, the preachers, whether they come on a screen or whatever, the word that they're hearing is, is good. I enjoy, I get teaching from some of these guys. They're just good people, but they just shy away from tongues. So what they've got is an informed congregation without power. They know some of the Word, but they don't have any power in their life. And they are oblivious to the things that are happening, again, that need to happen. And around the world, there's great Pentecostal revivals going on where the simplicity of the Holy Spirit's being taught, but we're not getting it in this country. It's amazing to me growing up, most revivals started uh, long before I was here. It was in England and in Europe and came this way. But while I was growing up from the early 1900s, most revivals started in the United States and spread around the world. 
Today, we're just being lax. I mean, it's like we're not even caring whether there's a revival or not. And so, uh, Luke chapter 11, I said Luke, Luke chapter 11, let's, let's finally go there. In verse 13, Jesus said to his disciples, if you then being evil, that word means fallen, that doesn't mean they're necessarily evil, they are just born under Adam's transgression, and Adam's transgression passed to all men, so that's the way we're born. He said, if you then being evil, that's fallen, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Notice it's a gift that we ask for. It's, and so again, being brought out in that verse of Scripture again, it's like a natural father. You know, even unsaved fathers are nice to their kids. Not all of them, but most of them are nice to their kids if their kids want something. I remember as they were, my kids were growing up, especially when they'd been so good. For weeks they'd been good. I hadn't had any problems when they said, Daddy, uh, can I have some, can you get me some gum? I'd buy them a packet this big. Yeah. You know, and they'd say, why'd you do that? I said, I don't know, I just love you. And to give that to him. If I would do that for my kids, won't God do something greater for his kids? God isn't fallen. God is not evil. God does not have a corrupt nature and that won't be removed until we get a resurrection body. But again, I'm born again, and God wants to give good gifts to his children. But notice this, he just simply says, all you got to do is ask. You ask for salvation, you reach out and receive it. You ask for healing, you reach out and receive it. But you also ask for the Holy Spirit. You reach out and receive that. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we're going to take a look at verses 16 and 17. Who cannot receive the Holy Spirit? He says here, if you being children of God, all you have to do is ask Him, then who cannot have and receive the Holy Spirit? In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, He will give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Notice he said the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. But in the previous verses we looked at, he said, your heavenly Father wants to give the Holy Spirit if you'll just ask him. And so he made a differentiation here. And the differentiation is there is you and there is the world. All right? You are the children of God. But the world are not the children of God. He said the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Now the world can receive Jesus. John chapter 1, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God and the daughters of God. Again, we become his family by simple faith. But he pointed out that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. I want to blast another teaching that's going on now. It seemed like the body of Christ so much is inclined today toward universalism. And it started, believe, I believe it started back, you know, some time back, and Carlton Pearson didn't help anything with his turning from, you know, uh, the uh, fact that we need to receive Jesus. And he got in the fact that we're just all children of God. And he pointed out the fact that happened with Jesus on the cross. He, he read to me a scripture, because when I first heard this, I couldn't believe it. Carlton was a friend, and he, in fact, his church met in our old building. And so he bought that, and, and our, anyway, our staff stayed in contact with each other. I got a lot of sermons from him. He was just a great minister of the Word of God. And my staff said one day, his staff just called and said, Carlton has gone for universalism, that we're all saved, and we don't have to go get saved. And I said, no, no, not Carlton. No, no, I don't believe that. Somebody's lying to you. So I got my car, drove over there, but called him, and went over to see him. And I asked him, he said, yes, that's exactly what I believe. He said, I had a revelation on a verse of Scripture. It said, Jesus has reconciled the world to himself. And if he's already reconciled the world to himself, then we're rec reconciled to him. I said, no, finish the verse. It says, now you be reconciled to him. Yes, he reconciled you on his side, but you've got to accept it on your side. Do, they have a, do you guys have a lottery here in Missouri? Yes. Do anybody know what it's worth right now? You drive past those signs. Well, Oklahoma, last I looked, this was some time back, ours was worth $180 million. We drive by the sign every day. And don't tell me you don't drive by those signs and suddenly start thinking, what would I do with all that money? Okay, and you know, I, I'm sure those thoughts don't cross through your mind, but they crossed through my mind. We drove by it one day, and I said to Loretta, my wife Loretta, I said, what would we do with $180 million? And she said, well, the government would get half of it. And I said, yeah, what would we do with $90 million? You know, I'll take the half that remains. That's quite all right. And so anyway, and I, and I said, wouldn't it be fun to write a tithe check to the church? Oh, man. I said, in fact... For 90 million, I'd give the church a third of it. 
I wouldn't care. I'd give the church a third of it. Can you imagine writing a check to your church for $30 million? Don't you know your pastor would never leave you nor forsake you after that? Don't you know he'd be a friend that sticks closer than a brother? I'll tell you what, after that, you would be next to Jesus, the apple of his eye. I can tell you that. And he would never, he would never preach again on don't buy yourself one of those tickets to get in the lottery. After that, you know, he'd probably say, hey, everybody go buy, <laughs> go get one. But anyway, then I said, then can you imagine, say, take another $20 million and just find you the best missionaries that you know of and start writing checks to all of those. I said, wouldn't that be fun to do? And then with the 40 million left over, I mean, buy yourself a house, a car and all this and stick the rest in some account and store it up for your kids and grandkids. After I said, wouldn't that be fun to do? Let's just suppose after I said this, that you went down and said, you know what? That sounds pretty enticing. So you go down to the little corner convenience store. You look around to see if pastor's in there or not. And you, buy, and you buy the ticket and you go home. And that night when the drawing comes, you're sitting there and you know in your recliner watching it. You got your little ticket in front of you and all the little you know, ping pong balls are flying up and down in the air. And the first one, the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one lands in there. And you look down there and you go, those are all my numbers. Oh my goodness, I have just won $180 million. And so you sit back and tell your wife, honey, we just won that 180 million. She says, well, great. And she says, well, what are you going to do? He says, sit here, because they're going to deposit straight into my checking account. No, they're not. You got to go claim it. Jesus went to the cross and made a proclamation. Everybody won, but you got to come claim it. He reconciled the world to himself, but now you have to come and receive that reconciliation. And so Jesus is saying right here, here's what the world can do. The world can ask for this, and you can ask for that. Jesus is God's gift to the world. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to His children. And so once we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, He now says the world can't receive the Holy Spirit, but you can. And He's simply pointing out there's a difference between receiving Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit. Now I do want to make this clear. There are events that happen from the Holy Spirit when you get born again, such as Him moving into you. You become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does give you eternal life. Those are unasked for, but that's part of the, of the new birth. But there's a separate act where you receive the Holy Spirit. This is called the infilling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Both terms are used. The baptism of the Spirit was used up until the day of Pentecost, before the day of Pentecost. After the day of Pentecost is called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Never referred to again as the baptism of the Spirit, but they're both the same event. And John the Baptist used it, Jesus used it. Even a day before the Holy Spirit showed up and He ascended to heaven, He called it the baptism of the Spirit. But on the day of Pentecost, they were filled, they were filled, they were filled. And Ephesians 5, 16 says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself. So either term is fine. And so, you know, I'm not going to argue on which way, again, they're both used. But this is a separate act where you receive the Holy Spirit. And uh, understand this, you can receive two members of the Godhead. Isn't that incredible? You receive Jesus and then you receive the Holy Spirit. What an incredible thing. But again, Jesus is God's gift to the entire world. And He comes first. Just like the crucifixion, just like the resurrection, the 40 days on this earth and that ascension happened before the day of Pentecost, so does the new birth happen before you get filled with the Spirit. And so those two events, the crucifixion and the, and the day of Pentecost were divided by 50 days. But again, in your life, those two events, and they're marked by two things. The first one, the new birth is marked by blood. And the second one, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is marked by oil. And those are the terms used in the Word of God. Now there's other ones, but that's the main usage of the blood of Jesus Christ for cleansing. And you receive Jesus Christ and His cleansing blood comes. Then you receive the Holy Spirit afterwards. It could be a day or two. It could be immediately right after you're saved. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. This happened in the house of Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts. Or it could be a length of time where Paul came in the upper coast of Ephesus, found certain disciples, not, not sinners, disciples began to talk with them and found that there was kind of a wall. They didn't understand certain things beyond a certain point. And he said, had you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So you received Jesus then, but has there been a receiving of the Holy Spirit since? And they said, we haven't heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. And he led them simply into the infilling of the Holy Spirit without tarrying, without waiting. They just received the Holy Spirit. So again, this is what God has designed for us. So the Holy Spirit again, and before we are born again, there's two ministries of the Holy Spirit to the sinner, and that he's, he draws and convicts. Those are two, Jesus talked about them. And he talked about the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he talked about the Holy Spirit drawing people to God himself. 
My dad was saved, oh, back before I was born uh, in, the, in the late 40s, mid 40s, my dad was born again. And uh, my dad came out of a, um, uh, Armenian Orthodox background from Northeast. He was up in Providence, Rhode Island. Met my mother during the war when he was stationed back in the United States after flying missions over England and was uh, in the South. He was in Monroe, Louisiana and met her at a base there. And so they dated for a year and got married. And so I have a Northeastern dad and my mom was from the Deep South. And so two different accents, I can tell you that. And uh, somewhere I settled in the middle of that thing. Uh, but my mom described the fact that when they when my dad finally got out of the military altogether, they were searching for a place to live. And he said, where, where, did, where was I stationed that you really enjoyed? And she said, Enid, Oklahoma. I just loved Enid. It's such a nice town and all this. And so he said, okay. So he packed up their 35 Ford and ran and drove to uh, Enid and ran out of gas in Tulsa. And so they didn't know what to do. And my mom said well, that night, I guess they were going to sleep in the car. And she said, I think think I've got some relatives that live around here. And she happened to remember their names, so she went to a phone book. You remember phone books? Okay. She, she got, got a phone book and opened it up and found them. And uh, so you remember cassette tapes? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I used to make those things. Now people don't know what they are. And, um, and so anyway, um, she looked it up and they called and they said, well, listen, come over and stay in our basement. Or we have a basement that's open. So they came and stayed in the basement. And the second night they were there, this couple yelled down the stairs and said, you kids want to go to a revival. And my dad, coming from the Armenian Orthodox Church, looked at my mom, who was from the Deep South, a Baptist that had never got saved. He said, what's a revival? My mom said, it's a church meeting. He says, I don't want to go to church. My mom said, but they're giving us the room free. He said, oh, okay. So they went to the meeting, and my mom said the first night they went, they preached a simple salvation message, and my dad shook through the whole sermon. There's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's the drawing of the Holy Spirit. He was so under conviction. And my mom said he couldn't quit shaking. She said, what is wrong with him? And she had heard salvation messages before. She just never accepted Jesus. And my mom said at the end when they gave the invitation, my mom hung her head and she heard a rustling next to her. And she looked, my dad ran down the aisle as fast as he could go to receive Jesus. So she jumped up and ran right behind him. And two nights later, they were filled with the Holy Spirit spoke with tongues, their life was radically changed. And so that's the, the background I came from. And to me, when I hear about that convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, I can't help but think of my dad. I wasn't there, but of course I wasn't born till later, but my mom described how he shook there in the, in the pulpit, hanging on the pulpit in front of him and shaking. And I've heard many stories like that of the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. And even, I like the, the Agrippa. I trust I'll see Agrippa in heaven. He said, almost, Paul, you persuaded me to become a Christian. He must have been shaking under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but finally said no. Conviction is the Holy Spirit drawing you, pulling you over. So that's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. But again, receiving the Holy Spirit is a separate act after the new birth, and it's accompanied by speaking with tongues. And this is the doorway into the supernatural Christian life. And so again, he said the world cannot receive this. So the world can receive Jesus and become a child of God. But again, it takes a child of God then asking their heavenly father for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So turn with me if you would to Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to take a little diversion. We're going to, we've basically come up to the front door of this, but now we're going to stop and go around and come through the back door. We're going to end up in the same house, but I'm going to take you in a different direction. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 8 for just a moment. And I want to kind of describe for you Roman, uh, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 is a break in the midst of a number of chapters that start in chapter 4 of the book of Matthew and go all the way to the end of chapter 9. And there's two bookends for this section of Scripture. And both bookends say basically the same thing. In Matthew chapter 4, it said, Jesus went about into every city and every village, teaching, preaching, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. It said he went to every city and every village, and he preached the same message. City means large cities, and villages mean small towns. He did not change his message. He preached the same message everywhere he went to. And then at the closing of chapter 9, that is said again, that Jesus went into every village and city and, and to preaching and teaching and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. In those bookends, beginning in chapter 4 and ending in chapter 9, which it didn't stop his ministry, he said basically all it was was healing. Healing, 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 healing. And then there was a three-chapter break in chapter 5, 6, and 7 for the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason why was at the end of chapter 4, the multitudes were so great, Jesus couldn't handle it. It started out with multitudes, and then, went to, and then it says it went to great multitudes. 
I was looking up one day in a, in a commentary, and they said when the Bible mentions multitudes, it could have been 10 to 12 to 15,000 people. But when it mentioned great multitudes, we're talking 100,000 or more. And how in the world do you minister to 100,000 people? I can tell you this, Jesus didn't lay hands on anybody. How do you lay hands on 100,000 people? Because it said they brought them all sick. Almost everybody out there was sick. Uh, you guys are familiar with uh, Marilyn Hickey? Yeah, Marilyn Hickey's a great friend. I love her. We've known each other for years. I steal her sermons and she steals mine. Okay, and she was always, sometimes she'd start to teach something. She'd call me and say, you got any teaching on this? I said, yeah. She'd say, fax it to me. This was before computers. Would you fax it to me? So I'd stand there one at a time, <laughs> run the papers off, you know, and send them to her. And, you know, and then she would teach them. I remember she called me one day and said, I feel so guilty. She said, I've been teaching this series for three months and never mentioned it came from you. I said, that's okay, Marilyn. I've taught your stuff for years and never mentioned it came from you. <laughs> and so, listen, I just want you to know, I don't believe, I do not believe in not using people's material. I don't believe that. I believe once it comes out of your mouth, it's public property. <laughs> okay. Because, <laughs> my favorite story, very quickly a story. I'm with Andrew Womack. We do this conference every year in England, have for over 30 years. And basically when I hear his stuff he's taught before, you know, and the crowd's different and all that. So I'm taking notes and stuff. And I was on this particular one, but he got off on a side trail for about five minutes or 10 minutes, a little side issue and came back. I never heard anything after that. I'd never heard anything like this before. His little 10 minute side issue was so crazy. It was so great. I'd never heard anything like this. It made such sense. I, the rest of the sermon, I was, I was taking notes on, flipping through my Bible, finding all this stuff, went back to the hotel room, put the series together, worked on it on the airplane, flying back to the United States, came back to my church and taught a four week series out of a 10 minute side trail that he had. And when I got through with it, the people came and said, this is some of the best stuff we've ever heard. And I never mentioned Andrew's name. I never said I got it from Andrew. And so later on, Phil Driscoll came to our church and we we're friends and he said, you got anything new? So I, I handed him that series and he listened to it and about a month later called me and said, that's some of the best stuff I've ever heard. He said, I sent it to Gloria Copeland. I said, oh, okay. Still never told anybody it came from Andrew Womack. So anyway, I no, didn't, didn't know if I'd ever hear from him. And so I said, I got a phone call from her office one day. They said, Gloria just loved this thing and wants to have, have it put into the believer's voice of victory. And she wants to type it all out. We need your picture and a bio from you so that we can put it up there at the head. And I said, okay, okay. So anyway, I sent my picture and all that. And there it was, a whole article. Uh, you know, and the article there and my picture at the top of it, a little bio on me and then underneath it, that article. And so anyway, then I thought, okay, maybe Andrew won't read it, you know, and he won't know that, you know, all that. And then so, but what happened was one day, then after that, she sent me a check for $2,000 for that article. That's when the guilt really hit me. I can't do this. So I, I went to the phone with a check in one hand and holding the phone in the other hand. You remember dial phones. And um, I called Andrew and said, Andrew, you remember that sermon you preached over a year ago in England and all that? You got that side issue? Yeah, I remember that. And I said, well, I made a story. I'm telling the whole story. I'm now standing here at the phone with a check in my hand and the phone in the other hand. And I'm calling you telling you that was your stuff. And he goes, yeah. Oh, oh. he said, yeah, that's okay. He said, I got it from a guy way up in the mountains of Colorado. And I said, you did? He goes, yes. I said, well, thank you. Hung up the phone and cashed the check. What else are you going to do? I'm not going to keep tracing where all this come from, but I do know where it came from of ultimately the Holy Spirit. And he has no copyrights. He doesn't charge you for using his stuff. So my whole thing is, you know, if I say it, go ahead and use it because I can't tell you where all I got all this stuff. It's just through the years I have gathered all this information. And so here we have the fact, what was I telling you about? Marilyn Hickey. That's what I was telling you about. Marilyn Hickey when I was talking to her one day, she came to our church on her 80th birthday and she was just getting ready to go to speak and minister in Muslim countries. And that thing has just mushroomed. If you don't know about her lately, she goes to Pakistan and she goes there a couple of times a year and the crowds now run almost a half a million people, 500,000 people at a time coming to hear her. And it's gone, when she first went over there, she'd lay hands on people. We got so big, she can't lay hands on people. And now it's like Catherine Kuhlman. She walks out on the platform and the moment she does, the power of God hits. And people start getting healed everywhere. That's what Jesus had to do. He couldn't lay hands on over 100 or 200,000 people. He had to just have a, the glory of God come down and people got healed. And she talked about how people are running to the front with, you know, crutches and all the stuff and, and just wonderful. And the Muslim leaders like her because she comes and she operates in signs and wonders, which they do not see anybody else do. She's a woman. And so they bring her in and she preaches Jesus. She should not be allowed in Pakistan. 
because it's a Muslim country, but she just has an inroad there. She knows the president, all this stuff. I just questioned one time, now she's 88. I said, how do you travel at 88? She says, well, I get on my plane, I get my business class seat, and I have my Bible on this side my, and, and my crocheting on this side, and I just do that for the whole trip until I get there. And so she just has this thing all worked out. And so anyway, uh, in this particular case where Jesus was, he couldn't lay hands on people. And so by the time we come to chapter, oh, and I was going to tell you one other thing about her too. NBC called her and wanted her to come on the morning program, the national morning program, and talk about her ministry. And she said, no. They said, why not? And she said, I'll only come if you'll send a producer and let him see what's going on. So they sent this man with her and he flew over there with her and she had him sit on the platform. She said, don't say anything, just watch. So she walked out on the platform, the power of God hit, and he was up there and the people started running the front that were healed. And she turned around, looked at him, his eyes were this big. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He just sat there and kept saying, I can't, I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. I've never seen anything like this. So when they brought her in on NBC and she was on the broadcast that morning, that man was there and they kept saying, what happened in the meeting? She said, why don't you tell him? He goes, I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. He just started describing what all he saw was going on. It's on YouTube, you can look it up. She was supposed to be on there for 20 minutes. She ended up being on there for almost 40 minutes. To question her about the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the healing ministry of the Lord. And anyway, what happened was here in this ministry of Jesus, because the crowd was so big, he took a three chapter break for the Sermon on the Mount and it was not to preach to the multitudes. The Sermon on the Mount was for the disciples. It says in the very first verse that Jesus sat with his disciples and taught them saying, and for two and a half chapters, he just taught the disciples, but halfway through chapter 7, the multitudes found him again. And in the middle of chapter 7, he switches over to a simple salvation message. Which road are you going down? Which gate are you going to enter in? Wide gate, you know, narrow gate and wide road, narrow road. And then building on the Word of God after that. Which foundation are you building on? And he simply sent it that way. And then when he came down at the end of it, he now had 12 men around him that could help handle the crowds. And Jesus could go back to doing what he wanted to, ministering to individuals. And starting in chapter 8, we have individuals, one after another. We have hard cases, simple cases. We have, we have the first one's a leper. Uh, he healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And, there was, and he ministered to all these different ones. There was Jews, Gentiles, rich, young, or rich and poor, young and old. Uh, there was the, the Roman centurion's son, all these others. Raised a daughter, a girl from the dead. All these things are in there. And... Uh, demon possessed people two at a time again all these things are brought up in there and in each case to prove Jesus can heal everybody of everything rich poor young old hard cases simple cases I mean a fever that's not a whole lot to that but you can't even heal yourself of a fever you understand that and so he healed Peter's mother-in-law all this is in there to show and the very first case that comes to him is an impossible case and that's a leper take a look with me here at chapter 8 of Matthew, and it says in verse 1, when he came down from the mountain, this is the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount, great multitudes followed him. Great multitudes means whatever he left back there at the end of chapter 4 has a come back again. And great multitudes followed him, and again now his disciples begin to handle it. This is where the disciples flunked the test. They couldn't even cast a devil out of a little boy, and Jesus had to come and rescue him. They're still in training. And so it says, And a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Them who? Them priests. As a testimony to the priests. The first miracle here is an individual miracle. And listen, this is the first time recorded in the New Testament and the book of Matthew, a chapter and a half through chapter 8 and halfway into chapter 9, individuals, one after another, after another, after another, young, old, again, all the things I have said. And the first one that's recorded is the healing of a leper, which was impossible. And literally, much like AIDS today, there was no cure for it back there in that day. And so again, uh, the first miracle is uh, again, and this is the first time he gets to lay hands on people. And throughout this one, one after another, he lays hands on people, gets to touch them for the first time. And now again, before the multitudes were healed in mass before this time, again, this is recorded back in chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. And then later on in chapter 9, we're told the same thing. And so why was the lepers cleansing the first one recorded? 
Why was leprosy the first one recorded? Well, first of all, it's impossible, and God started out by showing you Jesus can heal the impossible, what's impossible with man. But leprosy is a type of us. We're all born into sin. Leprosy is a type of sin, and a leper is a type of a sinner. A leper has this disease in him before it ever manifests itself on the outside. Once it manifests itself on the outside, he now knows he's a leper. Leprosy was part of the blood. And inside of that, of that man was leprosy in his blood, and then one day it showed up on the outside. It simply points out that you are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. And this man was already a leper, and leprosy showed up on the outside. And so this man discovered one day he was a leper, and then it begins to spread, and it begins to spread, and it begins to spread. And so, again, leprosy begins in the blood, and then, again, eventually shows itself on the outside. Write this down, would you? Leprosy is the only disease that was cleansed. Every other disease was healed. Leprosy is the only disease in the Bible that was cleansed. Yes, they were healed, but it wasn't called healing. With a leper, it's called cleansing. In other words, listen to me very carefully. The healing of a leprosy is more tied in with the blood of Jesus than the stripes of Jesus. Okay? Leprosy is called cleansed, such as sins are cleansed and diseases are healed. Was it healed? Yes, but the Bible doesn't say once in a while. I would say 95% of the time when a leper was cured, he was called cleansed. But once in a while, healing is used. But most of the time, the word cleansing is used. And notice this man didn't ask to be healed. He asked to be cleansed. And Jesus prayed, and Jesus did minister over him to be cleansed. And so again, leprosy is the only disease that when healed is called cleansed. Crowds seeing a leper did not yell sick, they yelled unclean. The leper didn't ask to be healed. This leper asked to be cleansed. And Matthew records that as leprosy was cleansed, it doesn't use the word healed. Now, yes, he was healed again, but I want you to understand, with a leper, instead of using the word healed, the word cleansed is used. Matthew tells us his leprosy was cleansed. Curing a leper was a miracle, not a healing. What I point out there is, yes, it's a healing, but it's a miracle because it never happened in progress in stages. It was instantaneously and that's what happens with sin. Listen, aren't you glad you're not progressively saved? Aren't you glad when you're saved, the moment you accept Jesus as Savior, you're saved? Aren't you glad your spirit is made perfect? Now your body and your mind have a long way to go, okay? You're, there's the cleansing of the, the, of the spirit immediately, but then there's the renewing of the mind that takes a, your entire lifetime. And then one day your body will be redeemed at resurrection. You'll receive a resurrection body. But again... Curing a leper was a miracle. It was instantaneous, not a healing which was progressive. All healing is compared to salvation, but not like leprosy. Again, all healing is compared to salvation, but not like leprosy. Jesus separated leprosy from all other diseases. I'm going to say that again. Jesus separated leprosy and made it unique among all sicknesses and diseases. And when he sent out his disciples, he said, heal the sick and cleanse the leper separated it. And so that's why, because this one sickness so stands for a sinner and sin and is used for a type of the fact that it's so impossible, man has to realize there's no one that could have done this. With Peter's mother-in-law in a fever, we probably could have thought, well, yeah, but an aspirin could have done that. And a, eventually, a, a, he, a, you know, a, 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 that fever will take care of itself. We can't do anything about it, but there certainly, and maybe a doctor could have found something, but no doctor can cure leprosy. And the reason why he started with this to show you that he is so powerful, if he can remove leprosy, then Jesus can remove sin from inside of you because no man can do that. So that's why he started with this particular one disease. And so again, cleansing comes by Jesus' blood and healing from his stripes. But leprosy was healed, it just wasn't called healed, it's called cleansed. If cured, a leper went to see a priest, not a physician. Isn't that interesting? Examined not by a physician. I don't think there's anything wrong when a person gets healed in church, say, go to your doctor and check it out. If you're, and we know you're healed, let's have the doctor verify it. But to have verification, anybody else could have gone and seen a physician, but when a leper was healed, cleansed, he had to go see a priest who knows nothing about anything except the fact he knows good and well because why your, your name was on the leper rolls, now it's no longer needed to be on the leper rolls because we've checked you out. 
And so again, if Curity went to see a priest, only two lepers were cleansed in the Old Testament. Only two. Miriam, which was Moses' sister, and then Naaman the leper. Miriam was cleansed. Remember, she rebelled against her brother, said, I can run the nation as good as you can. The moment she said that, bam, she was covered with leprosy from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. After repentance, she was cleansed, completely cleansed. But she never saw a priest. Why? Because the law didn't exist yet. Later on it did. But it's commanded in the law of Moses that you go see a priest. Now Naaman later was cleansed, but he was a Syrian. So he never had to go to the priest because he's not under the Jewish law. And he was cleansed during the time of, of Elisha. And so again, but notice how he was cleansed. He dipped seven times in the Jordan. And when he came up that seventh time, immediately he was completely cleansed. But he didn't have to go see the priest. So here's what happened. Listen, only two in the Old Testament were ever cleansed of leprosy. Neither one went to see a priest. This man is the first one who ever went to see a priest that Jesus cleansed. He said, go see the priest and, and take, the, take the sacrifice that Moses commanded. Wonder what those priests thought. Here came this guy and they said, what are you here for? Uh, I was a leper, I've been cleansed. Really? Yes, and, they, and this man that did it said, I'm supposed to come and see you and bring the sacrifice that Moses commanded. Can you tell me what I'm supposed to do? And they probably went, uh, I don't know, just a minute. They went back and began to look through the scrolls. They finally find Leviticus chapter 14. They probably went, blew the dust off of it and said, what are we supposed to do? Number one, we do this. Number two, now they memorized the first five books of the Bible. They remember the section back there, but they don't remember it in detail. And they're going, number one, we're supposed to do this. He's supposed to go get two, or we're supposed to have two sparrows for this guy. Next of all, some scarlet, some hyssop, and some running water. And they go down the list of things they're supposed to do. And so they do this, and they're probably coming back out to him. Just a minute, we got to go to number three. Number three, we're supposed to do this. Just a minute, and then we come back to this one. And why was this? Because he said, it's a sign to them. I want you to go do as a testimony to them. What's the testimony? No one can do this except Messiah. Messiah must be here. This man was an open declaration that Messiah had come because they pulled out a section of scripture that had never been used. Isn't that incredible? And so they did this. So how about let's go to Leviticus chapter 14 and find out what went on. Let's find out what happened with this man. Here's a leper who's just been cleansed. Go to Leviticus chapter 14. You might have to blow the dust off of it because you haven't opened to Leviticus 14 ever. It's back there where the pages are white and still stuck together, okay? Leviticus chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read down through verse 7. It said, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Notice, not the week, not the month, in the day of his cleansing. He's cleansed it, bam, one day. By the end of the day, this guy is different. With something that was incurable. He will be brought to the priest, and the priest will go out of the camp and examine him. Notice where that lepers lived, outside the camp. This is a symbol for sinners. Jesus was crucified outside the camp. And it says again that the priest will go outside the camp, examine him, and indeed if the leprosy uh, is healed in the leper, the priest will command to be taken for him who is to be cleansed, two living clean birds. Underline the word birds. The Hebrew word is sparrows. Two clean sparrows, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest will command one of the birds to be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And the living bird, he will take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them into, and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he will sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from leprosy, and pronounce him clean, and let the living bird loose into the open field. First of all, the examination was done outside the camp. Hebrews 13, 12 tells us that this is where sin are is outside the camp and this is where Jesus went to be crucified. Next of all he sacrificed two birds. They were, they were sparrows. The cheapness of a sparrow is incredible. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29 Jesus said, aren't two sparrows sold for a farthing? A farthing is three-eighths of a cent. You could buy two sparrows for sacrifice for three-eighths of a cent, and this was reserved mainly for the leper because the leper was broke, had virtually nothing, but if he was charged for this thing, most anybody could cough up three-eighths of a cent. But two sparrows were that. And so here's what the sparrows were. 
the sparrows were taken, and one sparrow stands for you, and one sparrow stands for Jesus. And one sparrow is cut open and killed, and the blood from that is mingled with water. The hyssop and the scarlet are also put into it, but the water is allowed to run over that bird into a basin. And then the living bird is dipped into that water and then allowed to go free. Jesus is the bird that was killed, and we are the birds that were dipped in his blood, and whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But I want you to notice something. Two sparrows... Jesus didn't come to this earth as an eagle to die for the sparrows. He became a sparrow like all of us. He took down to the lowest common denominator that could possibly be found. And Jesus came to this earth, one of us, undesirable, looked like anybody else in the street, didn't stand out. He didn't look like Charlton Heston. He didn't look like, you know, you know, anybody else, John Wayne or anybody. He just looked like any common person. In fact, he probably just didn't look as good as some common people. The Bible said there was nothing in him we should desire. He looked like everybody else. He came to this earth as a sparrow, came to the lowest of the low, became the lowest of the low, and died for us. For three-eighths of a cent, you could buy me and Jesus at the same time. But Jesus was shed and His blood was shed for us so that we could be cleansed. And then here's what happened. The blood was put on that sparrow, and then the blood was sprinkled on the man. And then again, after all this was done. Now let me tell you what happened in the next three verses because we're going to jump over to another section. In the next three verses, this man, after being examined and the blood and all that, the the shed uh, bird, all that was put on the other bird and it was sprinkled on him, the man was shaved completely. Every hair on his body was shaved off. His head, his beard, his eyelashes, all his chest, his back, his legs, everything, this man was completely shaven and then taken into town. And he was allowed to go back into the city where, or into the camp where everybody else was. And the camp represents all believers. But he's been on the outside, now he comes on the inside, but he was shaved completely. And he went to, a, he went to his home. Where there was a home set up for him, a tent set up for him. But he wasn't allowed to go in for seven days. He stayed outside for seven days. For seven days he sat there. And the reason why he was outside there, the priest examined him. In here people could examine him. They could walk by him because they shaved him completely. You could see his arms are clean, his head is clean, his neck is clean, his legs are clean. There is not one bit of leprosy left on him. And it was a co- and then after seven days, he was declared to be clean inside the camp. Outside the camp, inside the camp. Listen to me, this simply tells me when you're first born again, don't sit at home and not show anybody. Tell the world you've been saved. Show them what Jesus has done for you. And so in this case, again, that's what happened. And then after that, on the eighth day, say the eighth day. On the eighth day, after seven days after his cleansing, on the eighth day, this man's head was reshaved and everything on his face was reshaved. Not his body, just his face. His beard was shaved, his uh, eyebrows were shaved. Uh, With me, my ears were plucked. Uh, All the different things, that's just a joke. Anyway... All the hair was removed from his head, from his face, and all of this. And I want you to move back down with me to the next verse of Scripture. Go with me to verse 10. Again, it was the eighth day all this happened. We shaved his head, his beard, his eyebrows. He was bathed again, and all his clothes were washed. And now he goes and does another sacrifice in the camp. And this time at the door of the tabernacle. Beginning in verse 10, on the eighth day, say eighth day, He will take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, as a grain offering and one log of oil. Then the priest will make him clean. The priest who made him clean will present the man who will be made clean and his things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest will take one male lamb, offer it as a trespass offering, and the log of oil, wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he will kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. The priest will take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest will put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot. Do we have any man in here who is, ah, you, Would you come up here for just a moment, stand right down here? I wanted somebody with no hair on his head, and you're about as close as I can find in here today. So come on down here. Just turn around here. I want you to face the congregation, face the people. And here was the leper, and here was, I'm the priest, here's the leper, okay? He's he's just been shaved. Pretend all this hair on the side isn't quite there, okay? And he's been totally cleansed. 
I mean, this man for seven days has been there in the camp and his arms have been shaved, legs, chest, everything else. But at the end of seven days, he bathes again, cleans his clothes, and, they, and he shaves everything on his head and his beard and his eyebrows are all shaved and he's out there. And on the eighth day, here's what happens. They offer this time a lamb. And the blood of the lamb is not just sprinkled in the air like it was with the bird and sprinkled on. This time, specific things are taken. And with the blood of and with the blood in a bowl, here's what the priest does. He takes and he dips his finger in there and he puts it on the tip of the right ear. Put your thumb up here if you would. On the tip of the right, and you, don't, you okay, yes, but you don't need to put your foot up here. And on the, and on the big toe of the right foot and to show cleansing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does this show? Well, what this shows is the fact that he has now basically received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Stay right here for just a moment because I'm going to come back to you but it wasn't over yet. It wasn't over yet. Jump down with me, if you would, to verse 15. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest will dip his right finger in the oil in the, his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the log of oil uh, with his finger seven times before the Lord. And the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest shall put some on the tip of the right ear of him is to be cleansed on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot on the blood of the trespass offering. Now the man, the priest comes and pours this oil into his left hand and he takes it and puts it on the tip of the right ear on top of the oil, on the thumb on top of the oil, on the toe on top of the oil. Why on top of the oil? Because the oil can't touch the skin. The oil can only touch the blood. The blood can touch the skin because the blood became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, whom the world cannot receive. Once you receive the blood, then you can receive the oil. But the oil has to sit on top of the blood because it's the Holy Spirit and in our body we're still not holy yet. But Jesus became sin for us. So the oil can sit on top of the blood. Now here's the thing. Why the ear? Why the thumb? And why the toe? The moment you're born again and the blood touches your ear, your thumb, and your toe, here's what happens. You're now cleansed and you can begin to hear things you've never heard before. You suddenly bear witness with the Holy Spirit that you're a child of God. Wow. You don't, listen, when a person gets born again, you don't have to try to convince them they're going to heaven. They just know it. They just know it. I don't know. I don't know. I've never heard. I, I'm just going to go to heaven. And it's also on your right thumb. What does the right thumb mean? Well, until now you've done good works for the Lord, but now they count. So you can't get saved by good works. What your thumb can do, your hand can do, you can't, you can't get saved by that. But once you're saved, the Bible says you're saved unto good works, but that takes the blood first on the thumb. Now I'm backed by the Lord. The things I do count for the Lord. Now I can clothe the naked and I can feed the poor. And all those things that Jesus said to those people, said, I was in prison, you visited me. All those things count after we receive Jesus as Savior, but not before we receive Jesus as Savior. And now for the toe, before this you went wherever you wanted to, now you're going to start receiving direction. The Bible gives you the first direction the moment you're saved. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why the toe? Because it's the feet that the Lord is looking for. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of peace. Part of your armor is your feet are covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It represents you have a gospel to take to the world and now you have a commission to go do it. But why the oil on top of the blood? Because the moment the oil touches the blood, what you hear is expanded exponentially. You not only know you're a child of God, now you can receive direction. No to Bithynia. Absolutely no to South to Asia. I can have visions and revelations from the Lord on not only where to go, which specific country to go to, which specific part of the country to go to, which building to go to, which time I'm supposed to take, what I'm supposed to preach. That doesn't come from just the blood. It comes from the oil touching the blood. And believe me, it's like a radical change 
change in what you can hear. Now your thumb. Now with your thumb you not only can clothe the naked and feed the hungry and give to the poor, now your hands can see operations of healings and working of miracles coming through those same hands. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That is given to the spirit-filled Christian because yes you can do good things for the Lord but your works are literally exploded exponentially by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now your feet can know exactly where to go. You no longer have direction again just to go preach the gospel. God begin to give you specific things. He can show you what country to go to. All these things because you not only hear it, now you've got feet that can actually go out and do the last part of it. But let me tell you the part I haven't read yet. The rest of the oil that was there was dumped on the head. All of it. A drop here, a drop here, a drop here, but a whole massive amount on the head. Why? Because now that you've been born again, the Word of God says He will lead you and guide you into all truth. The Word explodes like you've never seen before. Revelation of Scripture like you've never seen before. You open the Bible in verses that used to go, oh, I like that verse of Scripture. Now revelation comes from it. You not only see a whole verse, you can see one word jump out and give you a whole revelation that lasts you throughout the day. As you meditate on the Word of God throughout the day, praying in tongues just helps that Word just explode in front of you. That's why we have what Jesus said, whom the world cannot receive. But sadly, we have people walking around today with blood on the ear, on the toe, and on the thumb who never know about the power of the oil being placed on top of that. Thank you so much. You can go and be seated. Isn't Jesus great? So again, what happened was, it says in verse 18, the rest that is on the priest's hand, he will put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, so the priest will make an atonement for him before the Lord. Acts 1.8, you already know it. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So, what happened? Now the ear can receive supernatural sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's voice. The thumb is unhindered in the works that it can do, supernatural signs and wonders. The toe is unhindered in its divine guidance, specific direction. The places to go exactly in the head can now receive revelation of Scripture. Let me ask you, what does the number eight represent? New beginnings. New beginnings. You think you had a beginning when you got saved? Let me tell you something. Nowhere near what happens to you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a radical change in your life. What day was the male child circumcised on? To remove a hindrance. I'm simply telling you, you're born again, but you still have hindrances that can only be removed by the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, you're on your way to heaven, but nowhere near the rewards you can receive when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the infilling, the baptism of the Spirit, is not to take you to heaven is to give you some heaven while you're here on earth. The new birth takes you to heaven. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, and it's received as simply as the new birth is. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And so again, all this is to amplify what God wants you to know and what God wants you to do. That removal of the foreskin on that little son removed a hindrance that was there. And I'm simply here to tell you, you think Peter was saved? Yes. Was he ashamed of Jesus? Yes. Did he back down in front of a little girl that questioned him? Yes. Around the camp, what was she going to do, beat him up? It was just a girl standing there. And here was this fisherman going, I don't know him. Shut up, I don't know him. And after three times, I mean, he felt so bad. There was Jesus, he, they, he felt so bad at what he had done. But let me tell you, that same man that backed down in front of a little girl on the day of Pentecost stood up in front of thousands of religious Jews and declared Jesus Christ as Lord, not caring a thing what they thought about. And the man that backed down in front of one little girl saw 3,000 devout Jews out of every nation under heaven receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, spouting out directly to them, you have crucified and by wicked hands have slain. The boldness that came on him radically changed. And a few days later, he was walking down the street and his shadow was healing people everywhere he went. That's the radical change that came on him. You know what I'm talking about. You remember what you were as a Christian before you were filled with the Spirit. And you remember what happened to you after you were filled with the Holy Spirit. A new beginning. So this is really what the Lord is saying. I not only have a beginning for you when you get saved, I have another new beginning for you down here on earth. It's a radical change. And that's why I think we're shortchanging people today, not telling them about the Holy Spirit not getting them filled with the Holy Spirit. I think when you witness to somebody, you ought to lead them right past that into being filled with the Holy Spirit because they're so open. 
and you tell them about it from the Word of God. We find on every occasion that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke with tongues. Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 8, in the uh, city of Samaria, when Philip went there and preached the gospel, after he had got them born again and they believed the words which he spoke, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they prayed for them, they prayed for them they might be filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, it doesn't say they spoke with tongues. Well, it does in a roundabout way. Because Simon the sorcerer said, when he saw through the laying on of hands that the power was given to them, he said, give me this same power that on whomsoever I lay hands, I, they may receive. And Peter said, you have no partner lot in this matter. The Greek word for matter is the word logos. You have no partner lot in this utterance that you've seen in front of you. Acts chapter 10, Peter went to the house of Cornelius. And while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on the entire bunch. They not only got saved, but a few seconds later, the power of God fell on them. And the, those that came from Jerusalem said, they're speaking in tongues just like we did in the upper room. And in Acts chapter 19, Paul found these disciples and prayed for them, laid hands on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. It hasn't changed a bit today because Peter said, this is for you, your children, and your children's children, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And in Ephesians chapter 5, it tells us, be filled with the Spirit speaking. When you're filled with the Spirit, there's a manifestation. You begin to speak with other tongues, which is the doorway into the gifts of the Spirit of which the Holy Spirit gives to you severally as He wills. But the doorway into it is some, a simple act of faith. So today, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, it just takes a simple act of faith. You believe it, now receive it. And you, listen, here's nothing too. They never prayed for them to speak with tongues. They prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues. You're not coming to receive tongues. You're coming to receive the Holy Spirit and you'll speak with tongues. It just happens that way. So I warn people, don't come up here thinking, I got to try to speak with tongues. That's what you're going to do. You can just come up here and receive the Holy Spirit. And by fully turning yourself over to Him, you'll start little at a time and it'll build and build and build. And so again, if there's anyone here today, would you stand up for just a moment? Is there anyone here today? Would you stand up for just a moment? Go ahead, stand up. Is there anyone here today that has never been filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to receive this morning? Perhaps you've seen it clearer than you've seen it before. And you say, I came here with my faith to get healed. Well, let's also use your faith to get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a simple act of faith. And if that's you, would you come right down here in the front? Because I'm going to lay hands on you. And today you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Leave from here speaking with other tongues. Anyone else? Come on down. All right, come on. Anyone else? Come on down here. Maybe you've never said anything. You're thinking, well, everybody thinks I'm spirit-filled. What will they think? I'll tell you what we think. We think it's wonderful. Come on down here and get filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I can tell you, I, did a, I do conferences for, again with Andrew, we do conferences. And one day in Andrew's conference, his minister's conference, it's all preachers, all ministers. He gave an invitation for any minister to come down there had never been saved. And guess what? 14 people came down to the front. And I thought, my goodness, these are preachers. They've never been saved. But you know what? They had to swallow their pride in front of a few thousand others that were all preachers and come down the front and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Don't you know that made a ministry difference in them? Then he led them into being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because you know why? The world can't receive the Holy Spirit. They have to see the blood before they receive the oil. So you've been saved. Receive Jesus. Well, I see a cross around your neck and all that, so I suppose you're saved. Are you saved? saved. You've received Jesus and you've received Jesus too. But you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Well, you saw the simplicity of it. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 19 and tell you what Paul said to them because it's apparent you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior. But they had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And three things happened. Number one, Paul laid his hands on them. I'm going to do that. I'm going to lay my hands on you. Number two, it said the Holy Spirit fell on them. I guarantee you, the moment I touch you, the Holy Spirit's going to fall on you. You're going to sense it. This isn't something where you go, well, well, maybe I will. No, you'll sense it. You'll know. Because you know what? I know it too. The moment I touch you, I can sense it too. It just comes like, like around you in the divine presence. But the third thing is up to you. The first thing's me. 
The second thing is the Holy Spirit. But the third thing is you. They began to speak with other tongues. It's just an act of faith. You just open up your mouth and start speaking. Don't try to figure it out because you know what? It doesn't come from here. It comes from here. Mm -hmm. Because it's the Holy Spirit giving you the words to speak. You want to give him permission. And open up your mouth and start to speak. And it will happen. Okay? It may come out in just a few words. It might come out with stammering lips. Because that's told in Isaiah chapter 28. With stammering lips, then another tongue. He'll speak to this people. If you learned a language, say you want to learn French. You know any French? Yeah. You know any French? Just a few words. Oh, a few words. Okay. You know any French? Okay. Well, let's just suppose it's a language none of you know. And you start learning. You get a few words, then it kept building and building. As you use it, it keeps building and building. This is a language. It's the language of heaven. Though I speak with the tongues of men, that's every earthly language, or angels. That's the language of heaven. You don't know from time, you could be speaking an angelic language or you could be speaking German. Somebody knows German and says, I heard you speak German. You go, oh, don't know a word of German. But that's the Holy Spirit. But starts out with just a few words. And so, again, I'm going to lay hands on you. All you got to do is just exercise your faith. And to help you, I'm going to have everybody standing right now begin to praise the Lord in other tongues. So you can join in with them. Just raise up your hands. Start praising the Lord in the Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus... Just lift up your hands. <laughs> That's it. Just open your mouth and start speaking. That's it. In the name of Jesus, lift up your hands and just receive. Just receive it. The Holy Spirit's power is all over you. Now, open your mouth and begin to speak. Just begin to speak. Listen, don't think it out. Just open your mouth and start speaking. That's it. Just open. You don't need to figure out what to say. The Holy Spirit would give him permission to speak through your mouth. In the name of Jesus, there's the power of the Holy Spirit coming all over you. Now just begin to speak. Open your mouth and begin to speak. Come on, just give him permission. Holy Spirit, speak through me. I'm opening my mouth and you're going to give me the words. The Holy Spirit gives you the words to speak. And receive the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we thank you. Now I want everybody to stop. Just stop. <coughs> I was taught growing up in Pentecost you could only speak in tongues when the Holy Spirit came on you. And so we'd go for years without speaking, waiting for another whoosh experience. And then never came. I want to tell you what Paul said. I will speak with the Spirit and I will speak with the understanding. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave you then come back on you. He's with you now forever. Not only living in you, but He's on you forever. In the Old Testament, He could be taken off and come back on. But in the New Testament, He's with you all the time. And here's the point. That means you can speak at your will in tongues. So, as you're in your car today, begin to praise Him in tongues. When you go to bed tonight, and you know what you're going to find out every time you do, it gets a little better, a little better, a little more, a little more, and it begins to grow. That's how simple it is. But here's another thing you're going to notice. You're going to start to hear things from the Holy Spirit you've never heard before. Direction like you've never had. I was driving with my wife in Tulsa. We crossed Memorial Avenue on the Broken Arrow Expressway in the middle of the bridge as we were going across the Holy Spirit said you're going to pastor the church you've been attending for seven and a half years and I just thought wow so we got home and I told my wife she said oh yeah I knew it a month ago <laughs> we didn't know when this pastor was going to leave we just knew it would be soon but he promised he was going to be there for the next 30 years of his life he'd only been there for a year and a half so I thought well Jesus gave me a 28 and a half year advance notice that I'm going to take over that church. And I thought, why would you do that? And when I was studying one day to preach or to teach that night in church, because I had a class in the church on a Wednesday night, my wife said to me, walked in the office, he's going to leave one week from today. He's going to leave next Wednesday. I didn't have that. She did. And you know what? One week later, he walked out the door. Had a 10-minute board meeting and walked out the door and never came back. And the board freaked out. They said, what are we going to do? And I began to see the wisdom of God. God had this thing all arranged. He knew what was going to happen, but arranged for me to take over afterwards. That's the kind of direction you're going to start to receive. It won't happen every day, but listen, up until now, it's probably never happened much at all. 
But were you born again? Yes. Do you know you're supposed to go spread the gospel? Yeah, but now you're going to start getting specific direction. And not only did he tell me that, once I took over the church, for at least a month and a half, he told me every sermon I was supposed to preach. After a month and a half, it quit, and I begged him to give it back to me again. But you know what? Now I had to study for myself. But there was just certain things that happened. Certain things like that have happened in my lifetime. It suddenly dropped on me when I was in college what I was supposed to do with my life. I was supposed to be a teacher of the Word of God. I picked the school and all that by the direction, I mean, with the witness I had inside, but I got very little direction specifically after that until all this began to happen and I taught at Rama, all these things. But there's gonna be specific corners you're gonna come to in life where the Holy Spirit's gonna tell you exactly which direction to go to. It's almost like he takes you by the hand and leads you. That's what you've walked into now. A brand new beginning of your Christian life. Can I give you a hug? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you too, the hug. Amen. You guys can go back and you can be seated. And what I've got out on the table, good stuff out there. And uh, I know we have a special going out there. The book that I have on life and power is available on CD. It's available on flash drive and it's available also on DVD. But if you buy the DVD or the flash drive or the uh, CDs, the book is free. But again, thank you so much. And I'm, I gotta go. I've got more meetings coming up in the next few days. I gotta get back to Tulsa and fly out of Tulsa and all that, so the meetings I've got. But it's been wonderful being here. You guys are such a, what? listen, there's nothing like teaching to word people. Yeah. I go to people that say they know the word, and I'll mention some verse, and they have to look it up in their concord, in, the, in the opening of the Bible, where to find that book. It's nice when I can say, turn to a book and you just flip right to it. You know where it is. But again, thank you for inviting me. It's been wonderful, and here's Pastor Larry.